Hello, welcome to Summerfest Online 2020. Thank you very much for coming along to view these presentations. Just a quick reminder that we have a number of exhibitors in the Exhibitors Hall. If you want to go along and have a quick browse, maybe do some shopping, they would love to see you. And a quick reminder too about our wonderful sponsors, Yayo Hemp Products and Butte Island Cheese. They're also in the Exhibitors Hall and they'd love to see you too. If you've enjoyed the show, please remember this is a free event. And if you'd like to make a small donation, you'd be very welcome. Please go to the Friends of VegFest page to make a donation. And a reminder too, we have another show in November, London Online, and in next March, Plant Powered Expo. And you can find out all about that on the vegfest.co.uk. Thanks very much and enjoy the presentation. I'm Claire Mann, vegan psychologist, communications trainer and author, and I'm delighted to be here with you at the inaugural 2020 UK Summerfest. Two years ago, I was with you in the UK, and I'm pleased that we can continue to collaborate around the world. I'm actually doing this recording in Sydney, Australia. So my topic today is finding hope in a time of chaos. And it's no secret to any of us that 2020 has thrown some enormous challenges to us. So in my presentation today, I'm going to be looking at how each of us can and need to develop resilience. What can we do, the routines, the practices, and learn a little bit from neuroscience as to what we can do to put ourselves in a really good position to deal with the ongoing changes and uncertainties. The importance also of learning to treat each other well. When we're in fear, when we're in a lot of anxiety and uncertainty, even the best of us can attack other people. There's polarization, there's the inability to listen to other people, and that's not helping us do the third thing I want to talk about today, which is learning to collaborate to advocate for animals. Now, I want you to reflect at the beginning here, how are you navigating the multiple crises that 2020 has brought to us? As soon as information goes online, we're seeing a lot of this sort of what well, always a lot of fake news. And I'm encouraging each of us to challenge that, to say, well, a lot of things are fake news, in fact, is finding time to find out what is the truth and what are not the sort of political ends to try and get certain information to us. It's always been a challenge for us as vegans. We know that more than anybody. So maybe yours being challenged by different perspectives and feeling overwhelmed and confused. For some people, they're really afraid for their health and that of their families. Is this the end of the world as we know it? Not only from a health perspective, but the everyday things that we enjoy in life, communities, festivals, travel, going out and advocating on the streets. All of this is kind of up for grabs at the moment in this period of uncertainty. Our families are getting really upset, particularly where people have different takes on what's going on and our tolerance seems to have gone down. Already we've got challenges if we're living with non-vegans, but this seems to have just brought us a double whammy, so to speak. To sort of judge where you are yourself. Now, when all this started to happen in the early part of the year, this was a cartoon that appeared in an Australian magazine and people went out and bought a lot of toilet rolls and maybe that was the same around the world. And this was a bit of a joke. Did anybody bring any food? So maybe you're just laughing at this, sort of dealing with it with humour because it's all too overwhelming. You might have lost your job. You might be a person that goes to your inner resources. You're doing a lot of meditation. You see this as a bit of a spiritual quest. But what we are experiencing in ourselves, our loved ones and our online community is enormously diverse reactions. And people are behaving in ways tantamount to bullying in some cases, but a lot of attacks and a lot, a lot of open mindedness. Now, if we're going to come together, we need to get our own house in order, to deal with the uncertainty and find ways truly to collaborate with other people rather than trying to impose our opinions on them of what is actually happening. Now, a lot of people, as I say, are really distressed by this because of the polarisation, you know, the, the stance we should take on health issues or other political issues. More than ever before, we're focusing on this when we really want to focus on creating a vegan world or the development of new businesses. There's a fear being promulgated through our media is that other people are the threat. So we're seeing attacking of other members of the public, our neighbours dobbing in, as they say in Australia. And then there's that loss of everything we value. Our communities, we're no longer anonymous as we walk down the road. Who's got a mask and who hasn't got one? 
But our biggest challenge as vegans really is this fear for the potential of a vegan world and the fear for the animals. Who's advocating for animals if we can't be out there? One thing I know for sure is that if we lose our freedom of thought and our freedom of speech and movement, we will not be able to advocate for animals. Some of you, of course, are drinking a lot of wine and, and eating a lot of cake, which in itself is a short term solution and seeking out counsellors and support and, and other friends to actually deal with this. Now, one thing for sure, and I'm really just setting a context here of how we're going to navigate all this, is that the mainstream media is hyping up the fear. Now, we are constantly told we need to look further and who has time to do that, we might ask. We need to make time to do that in the same way that we are resourcing ourselves with facts and figures to influence other people to become vegan. We need to get a little bit of a handle on what's going on and not jump to conclusions that the media is necessarily the font of all knowledge. In fact, the media, as we know it, is owned by six major corporations. And when they're answering to shareholders, their interests may not be in the publics necessarily, but they're there to actually continue a narrative for which they're getting sponsored and supported. And that's not being a conspiracy theorist. We know this is vegans. We know how hard it is to get adverts and, and promotions in magazines, particularly if you've got things like meat and livestock industries and those sort of industries supporting those biz those magazines and, and papers. So be a little bit sceptical. So are we going to shrink from this and say, I'll wait till it all dies down and goes back to normal, which I don't think is necessarily going to happen? Or can we do something else? Now, normally dealing with these sort of things is there's often a resistance to us changing. We've become vegan and when we advocate to other people, we find enormous resistance. Don't tell me what to do. The government would never allow it. I have my right to choose. But we do that too in, in other sort of areas. We hold a sacrosanct our ability to choose what we want for our own lives. But it's actually usually done within quite narrow constraints and information. So our resistance to changing, and this is a really good reason for it. And for vegans, it's it's our ethical imperative, our health, our environment. It's you know for people's health, health and well-being. But when there's fear and panic around, and that's being whipped up by the media, it's even more difficult to do it. So it's not just our health that's at stake. We're concerned about other things. We have to ask who is advocating for the animals here. Now, I love this photo. It was done a couple of years ago when I was out on the street doing some advocacy. And this lovely young man, if you were able to see the previous photo, he was heartbroken and his face was d distorted with, with pain as he was watching slaughterhouse footage. And then he said, what can I do? That sort of thing that all vegans love to hear. And I said, well, there's something you can immediately do in your next set of choices. What are you going to put on your plate tonight? And this was his face moments after. So this is a, a wonderful photo I love. Um, we've as we know with veganism, there's no bad news. But actually, who is advocating for the animals? We can't be naive and say, look, can we just focus on animals and ignore everything that's happening in the world because of our freedom of speech and movement? And we are the voices for animals, as we know. So we need to take some action here. Firstly, we cannot be instruments for change unless we resource ourselves really well. We've got to create new habits that systematically every day put credit back in our emotional and, and psychological and health bank. If not, we will get burnt out, even though we're not even out on the streets doing the work we would normally do. We've got to learn to treat other well. We've got to learn to treat other people really well. Other vegans are not the problem. We're not the enemy to each other. We've opened our eyes to the, the anguish of being vegan in a non-vegan world. But then... Because people are upset, they're reacting differently. So we've got to learn to treat others well. Only then can we collaborate to come together for animals and, and creating a vegan world. So let's have a little look at those three areas. We need to develop a sense of resilience. You may have listened to other presentations of mine, either in person or online. And I talk about the power of the mind. What was recently or formerly the domain of new age or woo-woo, so to speak, um, the law of attraction or something. What we're finding now, of course, as science catches up with those sort of practices, is that the power of our thoughts is enormous in terms of not only changing our own destiny, so to speak, our physical health, but also our physical environment. And this is a bit mind blowing to anyone who's been brought up in the, the school system as we know it in Newtonian physics, so to speak, is how is that possible? And yet we know in experiments, um, projects like the Peaceful Cities Project, the, um, the, the Power of Eight by Lynn Taggart, when we have controlled 
randomised studies being conducted is our thoughts have the power to influence outside matter when there is intention. Now, if it has the power to do that on large scale, we can actually change our own health, well-being, resilience, and then in collaborating with others, influence the world and create the a greater agenda for veganism. So it influences not only our psychological health, but our physical health. Now, that power over the, the body is, is really quite extraordinary. We also know when we think positive things or we feel upbeat or hopeful or our families just become vegan, we physiologically feel different. In that moment, our hormones, our chemistry align with that. The positive hormones of dopamine, serotonin, serotonin and oxytocin are all there, our happy hormones, so to speak. And yet we feel depressed and distressed by what we know or the challenges at the, at the moment in 2020 um, stress and cortisol go into our bodies. Everything changes. And then we don't see the good opportunities either. We feel hopeless. Let me just give you a couple of studies that, or presentations that actually show us the power of the mind. Now, anyone who's watched any of my work will realize that I often mention this extraordinary doctor, which is Dr. Bruce Lipton. He was a cell biologist and research scientist, but he was involved in the stem cell research. And he found in these studies, highly medical experiments, that whatever doctor or researcher told the patient in terms of the diagnosis of what their physical condition was or the potential for them to recover and have a better life, whatever he told them, that actually aligned with people's physical experience. So if someone said to a patient, you haven't got long to live, it was almost directly correlated with them almost giving up and, and dying or becoming even sicker. Such were the findings of this, the power of the professional's view and, and all their experience and knowledge coming to bear, that he left the stem cell research and started to study the power of the mind. He's looking at areas like epigenetics, and, and I would really encourage you to look at his book called The Biology of Belief. Now, he says... The fear of the coronavirus, for instance, is more dangerous than the virus itself. Now, that's not just about keeping ourselves positive because then we focus on different things. We know that when, for instance, people are given organ transplants, stress hormones have the power to move our immune systems away from the normal activity of fighting off illness to actually, you know, working in another area, sort of thing, in the fight or flight sort of thing, so to speak. So when someone has a a new organ implanted, it's very common that they would reject that organ. We won't even go into the whole issue around using animal organs. There's a whole ethical issue there, which um, I don't wish to support. But what we actually find is that as standard practice, physicians inject those people with new organs with cortisol. And what it does is diverts the action of normally just keeping us healthy and well doing off illness to ensuring that it doesn't try to fight the new organ, which is a, a foreign object. Now, if it can do that, cortisol, what is it doing to us if we're in a state of stress? What is it doing to our immune system? And that's why he's saying what he's saying is actually it's very important that we find a way to stay in a place of positivity and resourcing ourselves. OK, it's not just about feeling warm and fuzzy. It's about physically and emotionally changing our condition so that we can be the best vegans we can be. Another study that, although it goes back to 2002, was pretty uh, extraordinary. And if we really get the gist of what it's telling us, we will be, I believe, enormously encouraged in the potential of this for our own health and for that of our world. Dr. Bruce Mosley and his colleagues were again influenced by the power of the belief of a patient in either healing or not healing. And they said of a number of experiments, which is documented in a very robust journal, the New England Journal of Medicine, where they said three different groups, all of these individuals coming forward for treatment had chronic arthritic conditions in their knees, so much so that they were going to have surgery. And so we put them into three groups. The first group, they did all the normal things that surgeons would do prepared them for surgery, took them into the, the surgeon's environment, they put them under anaesthetic, they took the kneecap off, they did all the normal things they do, then they splashed the knee with water, which was pretty normal to do to clean it out, and all the normal clinking of instruments went on, and they patched the knee up, the person had physiotherapy later on. The second group was taken into surgery, they did exactly the same, up to the point of taking the kneecap off, 
And then they didn't do anything to that knee that they normally would do to clear out the damaged tissue and, and stop the friction. They controlled for time and clinking of instruments and did the physiotherapy afterwards. The last group was taken into surgery where they took them in. They set exactly the same time as for the other two groups. They clanked around with the instruments. They washed the knee. They did not do anything to the knee. They did not make any incision or move the knee or in any way. Then they did physiotherapy. What they found is that in all of those groups, there was no difference in the recovery rate of those individuals in those groups, no demonstrable differences. And all of them went on to be able to work, to walk with a level of ease. The key thing is that all of them believed they had had the full surgery. And yet it was only the group one that had had that. Now, if we really get this, it's the fact that they believed they were going to be surgically operated on and they were going to be able to walk again. And guess what they did? Now, that can be done by a very robust experimental design and controlled condition, we need to ask ourselves, we really have to invest in our health, well-being, our, our belief in what is possible, our physical robustness and our immune system to ward off illness, but also our belief in creating community and collaborating to create a vegan world. So you've got to decide whether you're going to focus on having an internal locus of control or external term that psychologists use is that when things get tough, someone who's got an external locus of control, their control, their reactions are subject to whatever is happening outside. So if they get good news or there's good outcomes or support or a new job, they are immediately influenced by that. Well, we're all influenced by things, of course, but someone with an internal locus of control says, regardless of what is happening outside, I'm able to pull on those internal resources. We all need to develop strategies to develop more of an internal locus of control. If not, we're like a, a boat on the ocean that is bobbed around by whatever is going on. The animals don't need us to do that. They need us to be robust, to have deep foundations that whatever comes along, we will pull back when we need to, we'll take more time out, we'll resource in ourselves, but we will keep advocating for them. Now, I'll encourage you to do a little bit of reading and, and research afterwards, but I'm sharing this to you to inspire you is, I don't know if anybody knows this guy here. This is Wim Hof. He's a Dutchman who has broken the most extraordinary records. And yes, you're right, he's sitting on the ice here playing a guitar. This extraordinary man has broken the record multiple times for sitting in a bath of ice right up to his chin without for extended periods of time without his core body temperature changing. Now, normally a body would freeze to death. He's able to do this by a particular method of breathing he's developed, but also the power of the mind. Now, I could see the skeptic coming out in all of us, and skepticism's good. Cynicism's not. <laughs> we need that. That closes our minds. Skepticism says, oh, tell me more. And that's what I want you to move to, if you're not already there. Is we can control our physical reactions to our outside environment. Now, this isn't just this special guy here. He does courses where he trains people to do this very thing. I can't even imagine sitting in a, a bath of ice up to my chin without hypothermia breaking in. However, he is able to influence the release of adrenaline and the ability to, to maintain heat in his body in a way that normally we don't really have conscious control over. It's an unconscious autonomic response. So he's treating people to do it. He has them running in, around in Europe in the mountains with just um, shorts and t-shirt on when everyone else is bundled up to deal with the snow. Okay, go and look at the videos on the wimhoffmethod.com. And I share this with you to inspire you is that don't give in to the fear of what authorities outside of ourselves are telling us, oh my gosh, we're going to die. Oh my gosh, we're going to get ill and we have no control over it. The big unspoken secret or obvious thing is we're all going to die. The reality is we like to have a bit of, a, hopefully, a good and long life. But don't give in to fear mongering that also makes you put aside your critical thinking to actually say, hey, just a minute, I was lied to about veganism and what happens to animals and the health of the diet we should be eating. I'm not going to accept wholesale that I'm a victim here. You need to be a, a victor over this. Look after your own house. Make sure your health, your emotional, your psychological it, well-being is really resourced because then we can actually move into collaborating with others, our social context and our wider ecological one and ultimately still influence that vegan world rather than allowing uh, our external 
fear going on that actually says we'll just all crumble down and, and the animals have to wait. All right, go and have a look at that. But just one thing here is this is an experimental situation in a hospital under medical control where Wim Hof took himself into the hospital and was injected with endotoxins which normally like a snake bite or something almost, where the, you would have such a chronic reaction to that that your body would not, some people wouldn't live. Um, he was able to ward that off. And this is all documented, as you can actually see. He's got a voluntary activation of his sympathetic nervous system, normally a, a reaction we don't have conscious control over, and then bringing his immune response. Isn't that extraordinary? So particularly at a time when people are worrying about this and saying, gosh, we would only have outside intervention and injections in our body to actually do that. Maybe there are other ways that we can take more control over ourselves. And in doing this, if we can change ourselves, we know that thoughts and beliefs affect the outside world. I mentioned the peacefulcitiesproject.org. Please go and look at those. So keep yourself resourced, resilient. The first thing is the power of belief and hope. That has a huge effect. Never underestimate it. It's not about being what we call Pollyanna or, you know, let's just pretend and dupe ourselves into it that a vegan world's coming. Let's make sure we create it. But thoughts are things. Beliefs affect our physical, our emotional and our ideological reality. It goes without saying that a whole food plant-based diet is definitely the way forward. Even often I see vegans say, well, I'm not really interested in food very much. It's all about the animals. The animals need us to be healthy, well, resourced so that we can be the best and the most alert that we can be. This is an extraordinary man, Dr. Michael Greger. He has an app called The Daily Dozen. And I know my own health by having a whole food plant-based diet. It gives me an enormous amount of energy to, to keep advocating. OK, and it also is you hear people say, well, I'm not a person that sleeps very well. I don't need much sleep. It's actually a myth. There's very, very few sleep disorders where people can't sleep or don't need sleep. All mammals need sleep, okay? Even insects sleep, okay? Um, there's not one organ in the body that isn't affected by lack of sleep or the right amount of sleep, okay? It helps us also to process emotional reactions. In fact, a fluid comes from the top of the spine at certain times in our sleep cycle, literally washes over the brain, desensitizing us from the most difficult of painful experiences and images we've seen. And we know in trauma situations and PTSD, it's often where people's sleep is disrupted through nightmares when their defenses are down and they're not able to physiologically process those emotions and terrible images and experiences and vegans have a lot of those often particularly if we're involved in animal advocacy is we need to sleep but we also in this challenging world at the moment we need to be able to process that really well please get hold of that book um, professor matthew walker there's also a ted video involved so this is all about really resourcing ourselves our nervous systems work very well when we're under stress they react to be our sympathetic nervous system comes into play is to be sympathetic to whatever is happening and to ensure that we're going in that fight or flight reaction when things start to calm down and yogis and um, people that practice yoga myself included know that when we slow our breathing down the parasympathetic nervous system kicks in and brings us back to balance and homeostasis that happens on the out breath so being very aware of what's happening in our own bodies, learning to relax, meditation, these sort of things, is understanding a little bit of the physiology I think always helps us because um, if we have information, we make informed decisions. We've got to learn to slow the brain waves down because there's a positive thing that happens here is physiologically a lot of healing happens and then our immune responses are affected. But that's where our creativity often comes from. Now, some of you may have looked at the work of Dr. Joe Dispenza, and there are a lot of people out there on meditation. He's a neuroscientist, a chiropractor originally, and he talked about the power of meditation. Meditation, when we slow our brain waves from very active beta waves, when we're in fight or flight, they're really active. And remember what's happening in our immune system, we're fighting off a situation. We're not able to make our robust immune system as robust as it should be when we're under stress. Is meditation slows down the brave waves from beta to alpha. It's often when we get those aha moments in creativity, often when we're relaxing or we're on holiday, this happens. But meditation has the power to, through those visualizations and intentionality, 
to increase the length of the telomeres on the end of our DNA. Now think of telomeres as like the little waxy strips on the end of um, shoelaces. They actually deteriorate over time and when they've completely gone actually we're no more, we, we, we're dead. So meditation has the power to lengthen them so in effect you're extending your life in implication. Okay so it's what I'm saying is that meditation is affecting our physiology. We need to be healthy and well to do the work we need to do. So it helps repair the body itself. And those aha moments I mentioned earlier as we get our creative moments, our eureka experiences. Now, I'm using these principles to help vegans to create a vegan world. And I put together a short vegan meditation of how we can teach our bodies emotionally what it feels like to be in a vegan world. Okay, if you're going to knock on the door tomorrow and said, hey, look, everyone's become vegan, imagine how you would feel. We can teach ourselves emotionally and our bodies to, to change physiologically as if we're already there. That doesn't just support us on this journey, although that's important. We know that thoughts are things. We affect our outside world. So please go and access that um, that. Uh, meditation on my website which is veganpsychologist.com and you can see the fourth life meditation there so these are things we can do ourselves also realize that we are attempting to make our world certain it always was uncertain we get older we lose our jobs we have accidents our parents die we have a great new opportunity we lose money there's all sorts of things that happen in life and we have this illusion that we can control it and we do that through jobs and contracts and insurances and pensions and all sorts of things. But really, we're just trying to minimise the effects of change. If you can learn to go with change and do what is called dealing with our existential anxiety, what it is to exist in the world, know that change and, and loss and beginnings and endings are part and parcel and they're growth opportunities, which is what we're doing in 2020. But our attempt to make the world uncertain can make us rigid. It often makes us not change. Look at the non-vegan world that says, hey, you know, I've always done it like this. This is my tradition. Tradition is a way of keeping the world certain because it's not an objective reality, it's subjective. But where are we doing this? We often feel we've made the changes in becoming vegan, but have we gone far enough? Are we keeping an open mind? So we must learn to live with the unknowing or we stay in the fear and we give our power away because we leave it to the outside world. So that's part of our growth. So lots of things there on resilience. Let's get our house in order. The next part of what I want to talk about is how we learn to treat others well. You know the term vistopia is the anguish of being vegan in a non-vegan world. Vistopia is the anguish we feel about the systematised cruelty towards animals. And then when we tell people, instead of them immediately becoming vegan, they say, don't tell me what to do. The world has always gone on like this. It was so obvious everyone would be vegan. We know all the, the arguments and there's no arguments against veganism. We know in doing that, there's almost what I call a trance-like collusion with a dark and dystopian world of which most people aren't even aware of. And then we ask, well, if I didn't know about a few, you know, trillion, over a trillion animals being killed a year, and, and is when we name, and we should, each individual fishes and sea life, what else don't I know? And then we're told we're a conspiracy theorist, okay? Now, we've got to learn to treat each other well, because I've never heard more than now people saying, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist, when we start to talk about what's helping in our, health, our public health in 2020. We are all conspiracy theorists. Uh, conspiracy, when we cons somebody is conspiring, it's two or more people coming together to try and deceive or do a treacherous act. Now, don't we know that about the meat and livestock industries or people trying to tell us that um, this is a diet that is good for us when we know it's you know causing ill health in 99% of the population? I want you to know that the dark and dystopian reality doesn't begin or end at the slaughterhouse. There's a bigger systemic ecological view we all need to take. So stop calling people conspiracy theorists because it's, it basically says, I'm going to laugh at what you're doing. It's you're being silly or thinking of aliens. The term conspiracy theorist was a term actually created by the CIA in America, which was deliberately put out there to downplay and to, to almost ridicule anybody who challenged the narrative on the death, the assassination of JF Kennedy. Now, there's lots of different views. We never, who knows what happened? The reality is it's then been used to discredit people as if, oh, that's a conspiracy theorist. In other words, you're going away from the truth. 
We know how many people have told us that eating animals, wearing animals, testing on animals, animals not having any consciousness, was what we were told was the truth. Oh, we're all conspiracy theorists because we go, hey, I'm challenging the narrative. Please continue that debate beyond it. And you don't have to say, well, this is right and that's wrong. You have to keep an open mind. So in keeping that open mind, constantly question the narrative. Remember, it comes, the media comes from six major corporations. And that's not saying that all of it is wrong there, but don't just accept it and give away your power. We know we've been lied to about animal issues and environmental issues and health. So keep an open mind, even though it will cause more anxiety often. Wouldn't it be nice to have the truth? Okay, is constantly do that. And you need to research alternative news sources. Now, my presentation is not about being political. It's about keeping our eyes open constantly learning about, you know, just even the argument welfareism versus abolitionism. Don't immediately discredit the person who, who talks about the meat-free Mondays. You know, I'm an abolitionist and yet I'm aware that people change in different ways. It's not a perfect world. Do we immediately push them aside or do we do a bit of research on that? Where's the evidence to say people will continue to change? Is this good or should we have that whole stance? Just don't accept it wholesale. But particularly at the moment, we really need to ask questions. Because if our health, our freedom of speech, censorship is happening, we've got to ensure that we maintain that. And so don't just accept what's happening. Surround yourself with people who question. We already do that with the vegans, but it goes beyond the slaughterhouse. OK, so I've just got a few suggestions is research alternative resources. Now, people often say, well, I'm really open minded to read all the newspapers. Bearing in mind, they come from six major corporations. Just get some really good resources. Now, these are ones that I've found helpful. Again, not to accept wholesale. Resource yourself, particularly with what's happening uh, in the world. Um, this is a particular one I like, seeing we're in the UK doing this, is LondonReal.tv. There are lots of doctors and scientists and neuroscientists and meditation specialists and all people. There's over 9,000 interviews there. It hasn't just come about. But a lot of interviews that where people are trying to crush the narrative are held on this site. And so I encourage people just to open minded. They're also very informative is um, just in all sorts of topics. OK, but that is a platform that is not going to get out in the mainstream often. OK, the Corbett report is often a, a really valuable one is just again, it is not that something's right or wrong, but keep open minded. OK, so in doing this, then is to collaborate with other people, we need to be open minded, challenge other things. And our key communication, um, I can really say that needs to be honed in terms of what's happening in the world and, and making sure we don't polarize and, and break the vegan community up is we've got to have some key communication skills. So avoid assumptions by asking open ended questions. When you see something in a social media feed, how quickly we see people go, nah, that doesn't feel right. Well, it's not about feeling right. It's about us being mature and saying, actually, you know, Claire, it's a bit out there, this thing on what's happening to animals in, in Australia. But um, maybe there's something you know that I don't. So whenever you see somebody say something that gets a physical reaction in you or is against what you've heard or what you believe or it gives you confusion because you think, oh, I can't take any more, is say, you know, it might be a bit out there. Maybe you know something I don't. Avoid assumptions by asking open ended questions. People you've stood in the front line with, people you've done festivals and businesses and, and vigils with, don't push them aside by saying you're a conspiracy theorist or something. Say, what is it you know that I don't? And maybe then I could share something I know about this perspective that can share with you. We're constantly contributing to knowledge. All right. So to help you on that journey, I've put together a four part uh, mini course, which is really why people don't change and what we can do about it. That's actually the companion to Vistopia. But there's a free four part video program. Get you those ahas in how much all of us, and I wrote this very much from my heart, all of us actually jump to conclusions. All right. All of this will help us in learning to collaborate with other people. And then I've got a number of resources to help you that are free. There's the Vegan Voices 30 day video program. There's an Overcoming Stress and Anxiety audio program, that meditation I talked about earlier, and this four part program. All of these can help you develop the individual resilience, but also what is needed to have meaningful conversations with other people so that you are oh, learning to collaborate together. 
Okay, now in terms of what we can be doing for animals is this is a great time. Maybe you've lost your job. Maybe you're having to work from home. Maybe we can't get out and do the vigils or the um, street activism or the outreaches in universities. Whatever your thing is that you do or going out there making delicious vegan food and non-vegans coming in and tasting the food or resourcing the vegans is we can be finding out a lot um, and resourcing ourselves with our skills. One of the things that we put together in Australia, because I'm very involved in, um, I do involved in monthly vigils in, in Sydney against general transplantation and vivisection, we put together a, a free um, training which you can actually access because so many people can talk about um, factory farming or um, puppy farms or whaling or live exports or something. But when it comes to vivisection, a lot of us go, oh my gosh, it's too complex. What does the 18 year old vegan do when the 65 year old professor comes out and blinds them with science about why we need to do this? We put this together de deliberately, a, a group of four of us, plus one of our MPs for the Animal Justice Party, and actually said, we want to teach people one-on-one -on -one vivisection so that you have the arguments, the facts, that very succinctly you can respond when your grandmother says, but if we don't test on animals, we'll have to test on people. All right, so that's a one-on-one -on -one training. You know, please access that. There's nothing awful to see in there. There is the documentary, which we had approval to do, which is called Test Subjects, that's embedded in it, and that'll be a really good training. So. If it's that for you, great. If it's not, make sure you're going on to webinars, improving your communication skills and, and doing all those things to, to, to be the best we can be. So in conclusion, is finding hope in a time of crisis with three things I mainly talked to you about is the first one, we have to get our own house in order. And anything I've shared with you is what I do myself. Understand that beliefs are things, thoughts are things, they affect us. Learn to meditate. Learn to reduce your stress and anxiety by slowing down your breathing, your nervous system, your brain waves. These are practices. Um, you know, eating well, a whole food plant-based diet, ensuring that you sleep well, going to bed at the same time, waking up at the same time, even if you don't get out of bed immediately. When it's all over the place, our immune system's affected, our cognitive function is, and we can't be as robust as we need in a in the world normally, and with all the things we have to face, the horrific cruelty to animals, we certainly our, our ability to do it is minimised if we don't get our house in order. Eating well, sleeping well, having downtime, getting off social media a little bit. So develop that resilience and you do that by putting that credit back in the bank every day and learning new habits. Learn to live with the anxiety that the world is uncertain. And we always assume it's like, I call it the what if down game. Oh, what if this happens? What if not? We never have a vegan world. What if we can never go to festivals again? I do the what if up game. What if this is going to wake people up so much that how we've been living is not the way we should be? How can I play my part in that? That's a what if up game. And as Bruce Lipton would say, it doesn't just make us feel warm and fuzzy. It affects our physical and our social and our external reality. But it's existential anxiety we're dealing with. We can't cheat life. OK, question the narrative. And I gave some topics aside. Maybe you have more and share them with other people. Nobody's got a monopoly on the truth here in terms of what is going on. And we know where corporations are involved and in governments and politics. It'll often be skewed. We don't have to get involved in all this stuff deeply, but we do need to keep our freedom of speech and thought and collaboration with other vegans because we're they've already lifted the veil. OK, treat each other generously. You know, people deal with stress and anxiety differently and People have lost their jobs. They wonder if the world will ever go back to what it normally is. They don't necessarily have the capacity you as a listener might have to deal with some of the challenging things in life. Teach other people, be generous, okay? One of the first things I learned as a psychologist was is when I saw people doing terrible things to each other and, and issues generally as, as, as human beings was to ask what, what possibly could have happened for them to think that that was a good idea. Sometimes it's the only resource people have. Our job is to extend that capacity for people and in turn advocating for animals. So increase your levels of self-awareness and communicate. And that one tip I gave you is ask questions. Don't immediately see where you jump to conclusions and it's the tendency we're under stress. Make sure you don't do that. The Vegan Voices 30 Day Challenge on how to talk about the most difficult of issues around veganism will help you in that. But also they can be used generally about um, communication. So I thank you for your attention. Enjoy the festival. And I hope to see you again in person um, very soon.